Episode one of the biblical version of All My Children, What's in a Name? Let me tell you a story. Our story begins along the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea. Here, a lowly nomad named Abram and his wife Sarai lived in Ur of the Chaldeans with Sarai's father. For reasons lost in the midst of time, mists of time, they move to the land of Haran, and it's there in Haran that God speaks to Abram and Sarai. God is called El, the Mighty One, or Elohim, the Mighty Creator. Elohim speaks to Abram and tells him to take Sarai and go to Canaan. Even though Abram is 75 and Sarai is 65, God makes this first covenant promise. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and I make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abram and Sarai, trusting in this promise, follow God, journeying by stages, stopping in Shechem. Listen for God's word to you in Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 7, and then 15 through 19. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And then skipping down to verses 15 through 19, God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her and also give you a son by her. I will bless her and she will give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, can a child be born to a man who is 90 years old, to a hundred, who is 100 years old? Can Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live in your sight. But God said, No, but your wife Sarah shall bear you a son, and you shall name him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him in an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. Again at Bethel, Hebrew for the house of God, the Lord appeared to Abram and ratified the promise to your offspring, I will give this land. So Abram built an altar to God there. But that was not where they would stay. They journeyed onward across the green and rolling hills of east of Bethel and moving toward the Negeb. But there was famine in the land, so Abram and Sarai went down to Egypt and lived there as aliens. As they were about to enter Egypt, Abram looked at his beautiful wife, Sarai, and realized the imminent danger he faced. Sarai, you are a lovely woman. When the Egyptians see you, they will kill me, but they will let you live. So let's tell them you're my sister and my life will be spared. 
Sarai agreed, and soon her beauty caught the eye of Pharaoh's men. Your Highness, they said, bowing low, it please your most divine majesty, we have found a woman, an alien in the land, who has traveled here with her brother. She's quite lovely, my lord, and perhaps you'd like to meet her. Sarai was taken to Pharaoh's house, and I will leave to your imagination what purpose she served in that place. But it suffice to say that Sarai spent a night or two at the palace, and the Pharaoh sent gifts to Abram, sheep and oxen, donkeys, slaves. But something was amiss. Pharaoh's household began to be afflicted with plagues. It couldn't be a coincidence, so Abram was sent for. Why did you lie to me, Pharaoh asked. You said she was your sister. And Abram and Sarai were deported. There was nothing to do but journey on to the Negev as far as Bethel, and once again God spoke to Abram and promised him, look toward heaven and count the stars. If you're able to count them, so shall your descendants be. And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. <laughs> but now the plot thickens. They were getting on in years. At this point, he was 85, she was 75. The covenant promise had not turned out to be worth much. They'd been waiting around for quite a while, and all their friends had grandchildren by now, and they were past the age of being fruitful and multiplying. In fact, at their age, multiplication was pretty much out of the question. Sarai decided it was time to stop waiting around and take action, so she suggested to her husband a commonly used solution of the time, a surrogate mother. Lest you think that Michael Jackson or Sarah Jessica Parker or Elton John, all of whom had children by surrogate mothers, are an entirely modern phenomenon, think again. We could call this part of our saga the mama drama because Sarai is employing a sensible and often used solution in her culture. Abram can father a child with Hagar, Sarai's slave girl from Egypt, and he does, and Hagar gives birth to a son, Ishmael. Problem solved. But now, this is where the quavering violins come in, where the minor chord on the organ, because once Hagar is pregnant, the dynamic in the household shifts. Her eyes are a little bit flinty as she looks at Sarai and a little bit too bold when she looks at Abram. She holds her head a little bit higher and her attitude has changed. Sarai, no doubt feeling threatened, experiences Hagar as being uppity and not knowing her place. Sarai takes her complaint to Abram who shrugs the issue off saying, she's your slave, do as you please. And suddenly Hagar can't do anything right. Every dish she cooks, every cloak she wraps, every bundle she carries, she is wrong, she is clumsy, she is too slow. And Sarai is harsh. Hagar runs away out into the wilderness in despair, pregnant, outcast. She meets an angel of the Lord and receives her own set of promises. The angel says, you shall call your son Ishmael, meaning God hears. And she gives to the Lord, Hagar does, a new name, El Roy, the God who sees. The baby is born and Abram names him Ishmael. Hagar, the slave girl, is now the mother of Abram's heir. But the story is not ending. It is just beginning, just like those serialized dramas never seem to resolve into a nicely tied up end by the end of the episode. For God, Elohim, El, El Roy, the Almighty, the Creator, the One who Sees, speaks once again to Abraham with this covenant promise, you shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I've made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you, an everlasting covenant. And Sarai will not be Sarai anymore. Now she'll be Sarah. This covenant-making God is now called El Shaddai, the Almighty One, the Sufficient One. Abraham, who was once Abram, has a new name. Sarah, who was once Sarai, has a new name. They are claimed with this name-giving God, and they are going to have a child whose name is Isaac, and their lives and the world are about to change forever. It isn't really hard to see ourselves and our own families in these stories from Genesis, even if ours are not that dramatic. 
we seek to follow God's call and see where God's, God leads, but sometimes we end up back where we started. We find ourselves in strange places like metaphorical Egypts and we feel fearful. Sometimes we're so fearful that we become entirely self-absorbed. We make choices to protect ourselves. We become untruthful and we even betray those whom we love and cherish. We hear God's promises of unconditional faithfulness, but we really aren't sure God has things figured out or God isn't acting soon enough, according to our timetable. So we take matters into our own hands, working out what seem to us to be simple solutions to complex problems. But then our simple solutions only complicate things. We find ourselves entangled and snarled in even worse traps of our own making. Fortunately, there's a lot we can learn about God in this first episode. God is multidimensional, bigger than any one name we should choose. El, God, is creator. Elohim, the God of gods, a plural name, over all other gods we might create. El Olam, God everlasting, beyond time and eternal. El Shaddai is God almighty, God of the mountains, sufficient for all our needs. These are just some of the names of God. And what are in, what's in those names? God's covenant promise, unconditional and enduring, the one who creates, who sees, and is all-sufficient. God does not forget God's promises. God will be merciful. God will be steadfast. Abram and Sarah, on the other hand, will not always follow suit. But we'll learn more about that next week. I'm going to go with the writer of All My Children, what she said as that soap opera ended after 22 seasons. We're not going to have everybody be happy and fade into the sunset, she said. It's going to be very satisfying, but there are some things you'd want to watch in the following weeks if anybody wants to pick us up. Until then, keep in mind, this God of Abraham, the God of many names, is the God of today, the creator the plural, gods of gods, God everlasting, God of the mountains, sufficient for all our needs, the God who sees even the outcast, even the enslaved. This God, the God of Abraham and Sarah, is here for you and me, still with many names, still present. This God continues to assure us in every circumstance, you are loved, you are worthy. Thank you.